morning, everybody. There's, I, I'm still getting used to this time delay on the microphone. Welcome to Palm Sunday. It is the beginning of Holy Week, and you are gathered here with Jackson Community Church from many corners of the nation. Some folks are right here in the sanctuary with us. Some people are in their homes in the surrounding communities, and we have people here from California, Florida, Massachusetts, Ohio. I think I've got all the states. Occasionally our kids show up and make us international, so you never know where we're going to have our visitors from. I want to remind everybody, because it's Palm Sunday, that we do have palms outside the church. So if you like palms, even if it's not for during the service, but you want palms, remember you, we have palm crosses that you're more than welcome to come and pick up. There's some outside and there's some inside. And we have palm leaves. So, you know, if you feel like parading through the village at any point today, waving leaves, we have them for you. But if you're at home, you can use greenery today because we will, we'll just sort of, we're going to be jubilant for at least part of our service this morning. You can use your hands waving in the air. If you have a scarf or a piece of clothing, people also use their clothing. They placed it in front of Christ during his procession. So your hands, a scarf, any leafy green you've got, um, just be happy today. But that's, we want to enter this day with joy and then think about its greater significance for the journey of events that take place during Holy Week and where we are headed as we walk towards Easter together. So that's just your quick reminder for preparation for today. Use your hands, use your greenery, come down and get some palms. A couple of other announcements for the life of the community because this is a busy week for us. We have two deacons. Bob Carper is making lentil soup and Sue Kerrigan is making beef barley. So if you're vegetarian and gluten-free and you want homemade soup, you can have lentil. If you're free to choose, you can have either one. We ask that you email the church email address, jcchurch at jacksoncommunitychurch.org by Monday morning. If you want soup, Sue's got a, an addition. Yeah? Yes, I have gluten-free soup. Uh, oh, oh my gosh, we have an additional choice. Oh, good Lord. Okay, we have two other choices. Now we have chicken Mediterranean soup that we can also add and Senate Senate bean soup, and they're gluten-free. So we're going to have to send you the entire menu again today because now we have two additions to the menu that I didn't know about, so your choices have expanded. So when, <laughs> that's a good thing. So when you RSVP, we ask you to tell us how many servings of each soup and which soup you want, and we are going to ask you to please put in your order by tomorrow morning because people have to go shop for the ingredients and then spend a day or two making the soups. The soups will be available for pickup on Thursday morning between nine and noon. And we know that there are a few folks that can't actually get here to get their soups. So if you know of a neighbor that needs the soup and can't get here to get the soup, we will make sure that soup comes to you. So if you want soup and you can't get to the soup, Please tell us that, too, so we can plan a delivery to you um, in, in a timely fashion. And Sue's got another announcement. Okay. Okay. All right. So um, we're going we're gonna to give them to you possibly in single-serving containers. And they may be frozen when you get them on Thursday morning, so you'll have to thaw them. Some of, the, some of them have been prepared in advance of this to make sure you have what you need. Okay, so that's preparation for Monday, Thursday, because we are going on Monday, Thursday, often we would gather together and we would have a community meal and then a meditation on what Monday, Thursday means around our dinners together. Well, we're going to have dinner together on Zoom, the closest we can get right now to gathering in person. So everybody can have soup if you want it, or you can bring your own meal. Sandy, I, for you and your sister, I can't quite ship it out there. 
And for those in Florida and California, um, I'm going to have you get your own soup or your own pref preferred uh, meal. We'll have bread to go with the soup that we'll be sending to everybody. And uh, we, will, we will gather around our common table distributed across the country, and we will have a meditation on Monday, Thursday. That's at 6 o'clock. So soup pickups in the morning, soup eating is in the evening together. Holy Friday, uh, we already have the Stations of the Cross put up, but we will have somebody at the church reading scripture at the top of every hour. And other than that, we invite you to come and partake of the Stations. And for those that are far away, we have now, we're preparing right now a recorded and video version of that. So you can virtually visit the Stations that we have up here in the church and still be part of our experience, and or if you want to listen to the recording and just take a walk outside, it, it's beautiful. It, it's becoming spring here, so if you want to be outside instead of inside, we have a way for you to walk the stations and choose whatever you want to be each station as you listen to it as a meditation. So that's on Holy Friday, but between Monday, Thursday, and Friday, we will be holding an hourly vigil. So this is where I really would like people's help. And if you're in a different time zone, that's even better because you can pick an hour that other people might be sleepy. Um, every hour, we like at least one person to hold vigil between 7 o'clock on Thursday evening through 3 o'clock on Friday afternoon. The last three people will be the people that are reading scripture here in the sanctuary, so um, those will probably be deacons, but in between, um, and the way we ask you to do this vigil is very personal to you. You can do it in your home. You don't have to come down here to the church. You can do it in California, Florida, Ohio, Massachusetts, wherever you are, in Italy. If you have a child in Italy that wants to be part of this, they can. We're going to send the scripture out, and you simply choose a word or a phrase from the scripture that talks about the events from Monday, Thursday, into Holy Friday. And you contemplate that word, that phrase, and you sit with it in an active way for an hour. You could be out walking your dog. You could be knitting. You could be praying. You could be cooking. You could be doing artwork like a coloring page. However you want to sit and meditate on that word, however it resonates for you to be with that word, we simply ask that you hold vigil because we are trying to make real for all of us in an embodied way what it means to hold vigil when we know somebody has been arrested and is facing death. Um, and it's important for us in our faith to realize what is at risk in the week of Holy Week. And so holding vigil is one way that we try to make real for ourselves what that means to us. We want you to have an intimate experience with this story. So again, email the church, jcchurch at jacksoncommunitychurch.org. Tell us what hour you want to do the vigil. It could be any hour of the day or night, that time. And if we have more than one person, that's fine, because then we'll have a couple people holding vigil, and that's good too. And then we go from Holy Friday. We, well, on Holy Friday, we will have a community worship service at 5 o'clock in lieu of our usual C3 Christian cocktails and conversations or Christian conversations and cocktails, however you like to do that. We're going to have a worship service that will focus on the last seven words of Christ. And then Easter comes to us. Sunrise service is in person. You are welcome to be together. Um, I guess if it's bucketing rain, you know, you may not want to come out, but we hope there will be a sunrise, and we're going to meet at the cul-de-sac at the end of Presidential Road here in Jackson. We're going to ask you to park along the street and not at the cul-de-sac. You can drop somebody off if they need to not walk a long distance, but then leave the cul-de-sac open so people can be socially distant, and we can have a gathering in person on Easter Sunday. Easter 1030 service will be the same way that we've been operating. If you want to come to the church, you can come in person. We ask that you distance yourself from others and wear your masks, or you can come by Zoom. Either way is fine. Um, we don't seem to have very large numbers of folks in the sanctuary, so as of now, it's still relatively safe for people to do that. 
And so to, you make your own decisions about what is right for you. So that's what Holy Week looks like. And I'm hoping, Billy, are you here? If you are, would you unmute yourself? Okay, Billy's here. And because the song's a little bit later in the service, and I'm not sure what Billy's day looks like, I'm asking Billy to introduce the choir song now so that you can, um, you know, you're free to do whatever you need to do, Billy, okay? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> so this is actually going to be a bit of a shared introduction as well. So I'm going to have Alan as well. Um, <clears throat> helping introduce my song. So this today, um, everyone, you're actually going to um, be fe um, seeing a world premiere of a new composition slash arrangement. Um, so in January or even late December, Alan asked me if um, we could collaborate and create a choir arrangement um, based on two of his, um, <clears throat> excuse me, two of his compositions that he wrote. Um, so they're actually you actually have heard some of these um, compositions played um, in the outgoing music, um, in the piano music that Alan plays. Um, so this, he actually um, made compositions based on the, um, was it the Lord's Prayer? Um, and as well, Hail, the Hail Mary Prayer as well. So actually, Alan, if you want to introduce the um, pieces, your sources, and also just overall your inspiration for writing these pieces, I think that would be awesome. Oh, thank you, Billy. Um, well, basically, these are two uh, Catholic prayers, um, pretty familiar, the Our Father and the Hail Mary, um, and they're often prayed during Lent. Um, of course, um, people often pray them throughout the year, too, but they're particularly prayed often during Lent. Um, and the way um, I was inspired by this, it's kind of a funny story. Um, when I asked um, Alyssa uh, LaChapelle to uh, sing, we originally were planning on doing the uh, Bach Ave Maria and then she said it was out of her range uh, <laughs> so I thought huh uh, so I, I basically wrote the Our Father to try and fit into her range <laughs> so um, that's how that happened um, and uh, then uh, working with uh, Billy has been awesome uh, because uh, there's a lot of things I learned uh, we learned a lot from each other I think uh, which is great um, and we were able to really come up with a, a piece that I think is meaningful. Um, hopefully you'll find it meaningful, but we really tied in a lot of uh, influences. Billy's obviously influenced by acapella, which uh, you'll hear that. Um, I know the choir, I can't thank all of you enough for uh, your willingness to uh, work with us and, and produce this, uh, this, this uh, prayerful piece. So I hope you all enjoy it when we, when we do play it. Thank you, Alan. And before we turn to centering music, I just want to check and find out, are there any other announcements that I didn't make that anybody's aware of for the life of the community this week? Not prayer requests or concerns, just event announcements. Okay, it looks like we're good with uh, community announcements. And so we're going to listen to a flute piece by Jeanette as our centering music this morning. So I invite you to put your feet firmly on the floor, relax your body, arrive in this place, and let's begin with the centering music. job, Jeanette. We're going to begin this morning with a call to worship. 
I do have a family that is signed up to lead us. Are the Roberts is here? There you are. All right. So they're unmuting. And what, how we're going to do this is much like we did it before. I'll read the leader part. The Roberts family is going to read the people part. The rest of you are welcome to stay muted, but you'll have somebody leading your, unit, your responsive reading. So let's begin with this call to worship adapted from Jan Richardson. Blessed is the one who comes to us by the way, by the way of love poured out with abandon. Blessed is the one who walks toward us by the way, by the way of grace that holds us fast. Blessed is the one who calls us to follow in the way of blessing in the path of joy. And we turn from that reading to the hymn, All Glory, Laud, and Honors. This is where we get to be jubilant. So get your palms ready, get your hands ready, get your scarves ready. And um, yeah, I'm sorry, you have to stay muted, but hopefully you know how to follow along with the music. The words will be up on the screen for everybody. And um, you guys in the sanctuary are welcome to hum. The more sound we get, and when we get to the readings, read out loud, don't read to yourselves. I think we're going to have to work on our Hosanna. So probably after scripture and before we start the um, reflection, we're going to have to get really happy because I think we're a little relaxed here in the sanctuary, much less out there where you all are. Um, usually when we have parades of kids and we have Bob Carper singing, prepare you the way of the Lord to get us going, and then we get into like the rock thing, that, that gets us moving. But this is a little calmer. And of course, now we're turning to confession. This is the last week that we'll be doing confession at the beginning of each service. After this, it will be built into our communion experience. However, we approach the Holy Week with humility. We've been talking about, through the Beatitudes, the gifts of being open, of being vulnerable, about placing ourselves into the keeping of love and whatever that looks like in all of our lives, um, in the ways that we ourselves have gotten it wrong or are hurt and in need of healing or reconnection. And so confession is a way of being vulnerable and open. It doesn't mean you're a bad person. It's not a judgment on you. It's literally a being honest with yourself and with your God about your relationship and that you need not to stand by yourself, but you need to be in connection with redemptive love to be your healthiest, best self. So let us turn now to confession. 
and the Roberts family will once more be unmuting, and I'll read the leader part, and they will lead the people's responsive reading. And you're going to see, we're going to start to use the word Hosanna, and the meaning of it is right next to it. And I really want out loud where you are, say it from your heart. God of all times and places, we confess that we would rather join the crowds than stand alone. Hosanna, help Help us, us, save us. We prefer the popular point of view to a solitary witness for justice and truth. Hosanna, help us, save us. We like safety and security while shrinking from the risk of involvement. Hosanna, help us, save us. We'll sing Hosanna when everyone else is doing so, but not when the hostile Good Friday forces may hear us. Hosanna, help us, save us. We do not like to admit our lukewarm response to you, not we want. Hosanna, help us, save us. There we go. We believe Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners, to reconnect people who are separated from holistic well-being, healthy relationships, and God's holy love. He came to change those people. Hosanna, help us, save us. Those people, they are us. We realize Christ came for us, not just for other folk, who have lost their way or gotten involved in obvious evils everyone knows about. Hosanna, help us, save us. We ask you to be patient with us, to help us understand our own accountability, our own sins. Hosanna, help us, save us. Then pour out your forgiveness in such a way that we are forever transformed. Hosanna. Help us, us, save save us. us. This confession is the beginning of our prayer time together. And now we move from this unison or this, this responsive reading to your prayers. We'll begin in the sanctuary and then we'll move into Zoom. We always begin with concerns and then we follow those with any celebrations that you might have. So I'm going to invite those who are sitting here in the sanctuary. If you have a concern that you want to share out loud, please raise your hand and let me know. Kevin's got one. Okay. Prayers for local ministers, prayers for first responders, and Kevin asks for prayers for himself and his well-being in this season. He's having a hard time. Are there prayers here in the sanctuary of concern? Then in Zoom, if anybody wishes to share a prayer of concern, please unmute and go ahead and let us know. I'm scanning, but I may not catch you, so go for it, Jennifer. It's I don't know if it's really a concern, but today would have been our dad's 80th birthday. Ah, so a prayer in remembrance of those who have gone ahead of us. Roy, I see that you're unmuted. And uh, I think on Roy's behalf, I'm going to ask that we say prayers for Roy and Nancy's family. Nancy, her life was celebrated this week and she was interred in her family's um, cemetery plot down in Quincy. Her family was together, uh, but this is the beginning of that journey. So please pray with gratitude for the life of Nancy, with gratitude for 60 years of love between Roy and Nancy and their amazing and beautiful family gathered together and prayers for comfort for Roy and Nancy, for Sandy and Jennifer remembering their father, for all of us who remember those who have gone ahead of us in this season, 
as we think of them and hold them close, there is a time and a place to give space to grief because grief tells us how much we have loved someone. Other prayers of concern in Zoom. Then let me just name those folks that we've been following. Scamp is safely home. Jack and Jane Steffens, we continue to pray for Jane. We pray for Judith Felson and her husband who came down with COVID last weekend. We pray ongoing prayers for Barry Brodel, for Richard, Sandra's husband, as he recovers or goes through his journey. For several people, diagnosed and undiagnosed, who have different forms of cancer and other diagnoses with which they are grappling for places in this world that we are aware that are in pain, Boulder and Atlanta for the shootings that have happened there. For our partner church in Zimbabwe, the Chikanga church in the city of Mutari and the nation of Zimbabwe. For the towns in Honduras with whom we have been partners. And we are going to do the body prayer in the middle of our prayer as a turning from prayers of concern for healing to prayers of hope. So how about if the Varans and the Roberts, if you guys want to help lead it, if you, um, you can stay muted, but if you want to stand up and just model putting your hands on the different parts of your body, for anybody that's new to us, we pray from the top of the body to the bottom of the body because we have so many parts of the body of Christ in our own communities, and our own families that are in need of love and healing. And we begin with our hands on the top of our heads. And then we pray for the brain and the spirit and the mind within that skull that we are laying our hands on. We pray for the things that can happen inside the brain, for the brain's wiring, for the brain's neurochemistry, for people that are living with changed cognition, for Alzheimer's and dementia, for epilepsy, for parts of the brain. And we have several people that have had different kinds of growths and neurological things going on, things that shouldn't be there and are challenging the things that should be there for the brain itself to be healthy and well. And then we move our hands down to the back of our neck and we think about our spine and how the spinal column carries all the messages from our minds and our brain into the rest of our body and protects our spinal column and the nervous system that radiates to the rest of us and becomes our messengers. And then we place our hands on our ears for those who need help with hearing or anything happening with their ears. We place our hands on our eyes for anybody having something happening with optics or vision or eyes. We place our hands on our nose. We place our hands on our jaws and our mouth. And we think about our mouth and our teeth and our throats and our tongues. And then we place it on our throats and we think about the GI tract that begins in the mouth and it runs down through the throat and it will continue to the other end of the body and we'll pray there too. We place our hands on our shoulders. We place our hands on our hearts. Whether we're praying for cardiac conditions or emotional conditions for broken hearts and heavy hearts and troubled hearts. We place our hands on our lungs. We place our hands on our chests and our breasts. We place, bleh, place our hands on our abdomen and we pray for our stomach, our liver, kidney, pancreas, reproductive organs. 
We pray for our lymphatic systems and our cardiovascular systems that are connecting us and carrying their own forms of nutrition and wellness to all the parts of our body. We pray as we put our hands on our bellies for the GI tract and the stomach and the colon, the rectum, all the other parts of the body that may be connected to that GI tract. We place our hands on our hips. We place our hands on our knees. If you can reach that far, kids, maybe you can do it. Your ankles and your toes. And then I love the spin. Anybody that wants to give me like a big body hug and the spin, spin your whole body around because we think about the skin that covers our body. We think about the muscles and the tendons and all the bones of the body. And we just give our entire body a blessing. And as we have recalled every week, but it's still always real to those that are struggling with different parts of their body that need prayers for healing, that we are praying for each other's bodies and that when we pray for each other's bodies, we pray for the body of Christ. We pray for the community. We pray for the places on earth and the villages and the towns and the cities who also need hope and healing and love to be present right where they are, just like here in our little rural part of the world and inside our personal bodies. And as we pray this prayer, we turn towards hope because we pray with hope that where mending and remitting and renewal and stability is possible, that this will be given to those who need it. And that where people are indeed on a journey that is leading them towards death, towards a new threshold, and those that keep vigil and bear witness with them, that they will feel God's loving presence and grace and comfort with them. And now, if you have prayers of hope, we ask first here in the sanctuary for prayers of hope, and then we'll ask in Zoom. And Kevin's got some hope for us. Give us your hope, Kev. He's grateful for the church. He's grateful for his friends. And he's grateful for the people that care about him. So hope comes out of gratitude. It's, it's an important way to show our thanks and our celebration. Do others have prayers of celebration or gratitude or hope? that you wish to share this morning in Zoom. We're looking for Zoom now. Remember, this is a jubilant day, so we need some happiness here. I'm looking for some support. That's way too quiet. Do I have to manufacture all the happiness here? Okay, since you're since you're going to be quiet, then I'm going to make. I, I'm hey, gonna, Gail, can you hear me? Yes, it's, it's Gillian. I'm sorry, I have a little technical difficulty, but I'm so happy and thankful for all of your prayers and the healing of my son-in-law and his cancer. Oh, it's just a beautiful time in our family right now. Oh, I'm so glad, Gillian. So, Thank you. Now I'll see if I can mute myself again. Oh, here we go. <laughs> and I can't get my picture on, so bye. So prayers of gratitude for healing where healing has been possible. We can hey, uh, I have something? Yeah, go for it. Please, Sandra. All right. Um, I have giving thanks because Rich and I will be two weeks past our second COVID vaccination on Easter and our family is coming up and I'll be hugging my family for the first time in a long time. Wow. So gratitude for how when vaccinations are going well and getting to the second one and then getting past the second one and how the world is opening up to us again and people are gathering in large numbers and touching each other and seeing each other in person when they have not for so long. We know what a big deal this is now. This We're walking towards the Easter that we wanted a year ago. It's finally coming to us, and it's been a long time coming. But if the past year, I hope, 
has brought to life the events of Holy Week and just how precious our time together is and how every experience of being human is so deep. So let us end our prayer together, and we'll go to the Lord's Prayer, but let us end gratitude by, as loud as you can, wherever you are, unmute yourselves, please, because I want to hear this, and then we're going to say the Lord's Prayer together anyway, out loud, so please unmute. So you can't pretend that you're shouting. I, you get, I have to hear it now, and the people in the sanctuary are definitely, I'm asking you to shout, lift your hands up, and remember, Hosanna, is praise, but it is also help us, save us, and it is thank you. So wave your hands in the air and please, Hosanna! Hosanna! And I want to hear it loud and proud. Hosanna! 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 Remember the people in the sanctuary can hear you. Hosanna! 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 <laughs> feel it in your body you have to really feel it there we go now we're starting to get the, the, the gist of it thank you everybody now remember stand muted because we're going to put up the lord's prayer and we're going to say that together our father lord, 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 heaven how would you be my name i can come Thank you. I feel like you guys brought that to life for me. I really appreciate you <laughs> getting into the spirit of that. And now the Roberts family will read for us the scripture that we're going to place up on the screen for all of you to see and follow along with. And if you're in the sanctuary, you should have a sheet of paper that also has the scripture so you can read along. When they were approaching Jerusalem, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you, why are you doing this? Just say, the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Thank you to the Roberts family for their leadership this morning. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. And so friends, you already know because you have said it out loud that Hosanna as much as we used to think of it as being a jubilant form of praise when people saw Christ coming through that gate, had become a ritualized form of asking for rescue, for help, to be saved. But by the time that Christ was coming through the gate in Jerusalem, it was a cry that was very real 
for the people of Israel. They lived under Roman oppression. They lived with injustice within their own community. And people had dreams of what the Messiah could be to them. And so the five o'clock gathering last Friday began to discuss what it was like when Christ actually entered Jerusalem because there were two parades coming into Jerusalem at the same time. Christ came into the city through the Eastern Gate, which was sometimes called the Golden Gate, but was also known as the Gate of Mercy. It was a gate that historically in Israel, the Hebrew scriptures told us through the prophets Ezekiel and Zechariah, was the way that the Messiah would come and overturn everything. And people often believed or hoped in Jesus' day that someone was coming and someone would overturn the world as they knew it, would free them from the rule of Rome, would bring them back to the glory of the days of King David and King Solomon, rebuild their faith community and its strength and its independence. And they were looking for that person to come through the Eastern Gate. They were hanging their hopes on those who claimed to be the Messiah. And there were other people claiming to be the Messiah in that time. And there were people that were working hard to bring about that revolution through violent means. There were assassins and plotters and conspiracy people that were working to foment rebellion and stand up against the Roman presence in Jerusalem. All of those hopes were hung on the one that was coming through the Eastern Gate. And yet he came not in the way that they expected. And he came in the complete opposite of the one who came through the Western Gate on the same day at the same time. Pontius Pilate appointed to rule in Jerusalem made a point of showing up on the first day of the Passover festival to a city teeming with people from a faith who lived in the diaspora all over the kingdom and the empire and came back to Jerusalem for the high and holy holiday of Passover. Hundreds of thousands of Jews from all over the land, all over the Roman Empire gathered in one city. You can be sure that Rome made itself known because they wanted to control the city when it was this full of people and rife for riot and rebellion with so much dissension and dissatisfaction already happening in the city. So Pontius Pilate showed up, as he did every year, on his horse, coming through the Western Gate, and he was not alone. He was with the armed legions and the foot soldiers. He was with the might and the power and the regalia of Rome coming through the Western Gate. And in his coming, it is likely that he embodied everything that people that hoped for a political change in favor of Israel believed and wished that their own Messiah would embody. They wanted they hoped for that armed, mounted warrior to come through the gate prophesied by Ezekiel and Zechariah and set things right in their world. And indeed, a man came through the eastern gate as had been prophesied, but he was not mounted on a war horse, surrounded by his legions and his troops. He came quietly, and the crowd around him yelled the way we called out this morning, Hosanna! Help us! And they meant it. They wanted him to be that one that would change everything. 
They said it with praise and hope, but they said it with fervor and the energy and the ferocity of people that needed justice and hoped that it would come to them in their lifetimes, in their society, in their government, that this would be the one who would change everything. He was surrounded by noise. He was surrounded by fervent, energetic, crazy hope when people ripped off their cloaks and threw them on the ground, cut the branches and waved them and wanted him to see them. And he came quietly. And he came gently into this crowd of noise and exaltation. And he came knowing that even in the way that he came into Jerusalem, he was placing himself in the path of all those who held authority and were afraid of him. And they had been afraid of him since he was born. Herod tried to have him killed as a child. He was so afraid of an infant that it is recorded in our scriptures that they took the lives of every two-year-old in the communities where they suspected that he lived. His family fled to Egypt to save their child. But he grew up in the shadow of that danger. And when he chose the life he chose, whether he was sometimes peaceful and gentle, often was. He was also attracting attention. He was also drawing crowds. He was also gathering up the energy of the dispossessed and the disenfranchised and the disillusioned. And they were coming to him and he was stirring up change. And though it may not have looked like the change that others hoped it would be, it was yet frightening to the leaders of his time. And when he came through the Eastern Gate quietly on his mount, the people made all the noise that had to be made and they drew attention and they said, we want change. Hosanna, we need something to change in our community, in our lives. Something's got to give and we turn to you for the change. He entered the city on the same day that Pontius Pilate came in his full regalia to show the power of Rome. And it wasn't an accident. It was on purpose. He was making a statement that change is coming. A man who may have been quiet and peaceful in the ways that he moved through the world, but challenged people's ideas of who should be seen, who has power and value then and now was drawing attention to himself on purpose. And he would continue to draw attention to himself during the events of Holy Week. He would under overturn the tables outside the temple where people were exchanging coins. He would make statements that were angry and rebellious for almost the first time that we have heard him say these things. He came through the Eastern Gate, the Gate of Mercy, knowing that he was walking, that he was riding towards the threat of death. And though we know that in the Garden of Gethsemane, he asked that this should not happen, that if God could take away this fate from him, he didn't want to go through what was coming. He also surrendered himself to where his path had brought him. The triumph and the joy of Palm Sunday is foreshadowing the risk because everything is at stake. He has raised the stakes by coming through the Eastern Gate. And isn't it ironic that in Jewish tradition, when people needed to get rid of their problems, when they used ritual acts to absolve the people of their brokenness, their mistakes, and their sins, they released a goat called the scapegoat through the Eastern Gate 
to leave the city and carry with it all that was broken, all the burdens of a community, to become the sacrifice that freed a people to resume their lives renewed. He walked in through the eastern gate where the scapegoat would be sent out later to carry all of the pain of a people in its body and its being. In his coming through the gate, he walked the path that he would return on later. Bearing the instrument of death placed on his shoulders by the Roman Empire and by the fear of people. And he would walk towards his death. The same gate opens both ways. And while power came in through the western gate, in all of its strength and its glory, power came in through the eastern gate. And it was a power that perhaps didn't want to walk towards death, but was willing. Was willing to do what had to be done to change the world, but not with violence but with a different kind of strength, a strength that sees every person in this sanctuary, that sees every person sitting in Zoom, watching and gathered here, that saw every single person in that crowd crying out to be seen and noticed and helped and loved them. The power of love came in through the Eastern Gate. The power of mercy and grace and transformation came in through the Eastern Gate. And days later, it would leave by the Eastern Gate. And the next gate that that life would walk through would be the gate that divides life from death. And then go even beyond that gate to pass beyond death itself into life and resurrection and transformation for every one of us. Love came in through the Eastern Gate with 12 friends and a crowd of people who hung all the most impossible hopes on one life. And here we are, and we're still hanging our hopes on that same life. And that story has been told down through 2,000 years so that we still go out and we get palm leaves. And we still cry out, Hosanna, even when we don't even know what it really means. But we know what it means to say we need your help. We need your love. We need your hope and we need your healing. We can look at each other when we pray the prayer of the body and we pray the prayer of the places that hurt in the world and we know that Hosanna is real in our times too and that it will not be the power that comes through the western gate that will save us. It will be the power that rides quietly into the presence of danger and risk with love and faith and commitment to make a difference to us. And in our time, that will be us coming through the gate of mercy for each other because God's love in the world is our body, our hands, our feet, our tongues, our minds, our hearts. And so the question of the story on Palm Sunday is which gate do you choose? By which gate will you enter? And can you hear the people around you calling, Hosanna, help me, save me. I need you in my life. I need love in my life. Can you be that love for me? We are called through the Eastern Gate. 
And we come with joy. And we leave with hope. But to get from one to the other, we will walk a road that will take us through shadowed places and hard places. And it will bring us into trial and questioning and pain and loss. And if we don't feel those things during Holy Week, then we can't really ever be transformed, can we? Because in order to get to the transformation, you have to get through the gate and open yourself up and let the gate, let the open door be the open door of your life and your heart. The gate is here in your life and your heart. Open the gates, the eastern gates, so that love can touch you and bring you to that place that can transform you. Hosanna. 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 Thanks be to God. Friends, as we become love for each other, your hope and your help is real. And so we ask for your ongoing commitment to this church by making an online gift to jxncc.org or by mailing in your offering or by putting something in the basket out front or in the envelopes. However it is that you give and make a commitment to us, please know that it makes a difference here and in other parts of the world. We are vital and we are vibrant because you are a vital and a vibrant part of our community. And so... Our choir has prepared for us its own form of prayer, its own form of hosanna, and save us and help us. Please savor with me the world premiere of Billy and Alan's music performed by the Jackson Community Choir from all over the country.
Um, feel free to unmute. The sanctuary is full of people clapping and going, that was wonderful. That was wonderful. So if you have something to say. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> That was and if you grew up in the tradition of having those prayers, how beautiful for them to come home to you this week and be part. And if they're new to you, how beautiful to hear them and let them become part of your tradition. We're going to wind up our Palm Sunday with the benediction followed by Alan will play our little interlude. And then we always have the coffee hour type, everybody's got their own coffee kind of thing where people just chat online. So let's sing together the benediction and then we'll enjoy each other's company after a musical interlude. <laughs> Oh, oh.